Hello and welcome. It is so good to be with you. My name is Caleb and I am the lead pastor at El Segundo United Methodist Church here. No matter who you are, what you're going through, or what you are still going through, we want you to know that we love you and that you belong here. And from the bottom of my heart, I pray and hope that you feel that from us today. And wherever you are watching from, I am so glad that you have decided to join us and be a part of our wonderful family. That word, family, it, it's a loaded word. Family is where we first find acceptance um, and belonging. It is where we are taught how loved we are, and, and we are taught that no matter what happens, that we will always have family. However, family is also the source of our deepest hurts and traumas. Because family is who we spend the most time with, and because people are not perfect, family is usually where we experience our first painful memories in life. When we grow close to someone, we, we open ourselves up to the risk of being hurt. We become vulnerable. However, it is only when we are vulnerable that we allow other people into the deepest parts of ourselves. It is only when we are vulnerable that we begin to truly know one another. And not just know as in, yeah, I know that person, but to know as Adam knew Eve when he said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And it is then and only then that we begin to realize that we are all the same, that deep down inside, we are all looking for the same thing, to love and to be loved. And so as we come together today and enter into this time of worship as a church family, I invite you to ask yourselves what it really means to be family. So please join us as Julia Clark leads us into the call of worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Lord, who am I compared to your glory? Lord, who am I compared to your majesty? I am your beloved, your creation, and you love me as I am. You have called me chosen for your kingdom. Unashamed to call me your own, I am your beloved. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. All the day long This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long Perfect submission Perfect delight Visions of rapture Now burst on my sight Angels descending ring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior the day long. This is my story, this is my song. 
praising my Savior all the day long. And now please join us in the opening prayer. God of love and mercy, we thank you for your unconditional love and sacrifice. You have given us everything to show us how much you love us. And we come before you with praise in response to your unending goodness. Fill us today with your spirit as we open our hearts and our minds to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hi, everybody. Did you go see fireworks last week? That was really cool, wasn't it? Kitty and I went to go see the fireworks at the park. Yeah, there were so many fireworks, and it was all so cool. Wasn't it great? Kitty, do you know what the title of Children's Time is today? Oh, okay. Well, it's called We Measure Up. We Measure Up, you mean like with a ruler? No? We're not going to measure how tall you are? Let's see how, how tall you are. Wow, you're so tall, kitty. Oh, okay, so we don't need the ruler. All right, well, then what do you mean by we measure up? Oh. Oh, what's that? Are they stickers? Wow, that's so cool. I love stickers. Do you guys love stickers too? Hmm, I wonder what kind of stickers these are, because there are a lot of different kinds of stickers, you know. Oh, these are affirmation stickers. See, look, affirmation stickers. So I know affirmation is a really long word. Affirmation means that you are giving someone something for doing a great job. And so these affirmation stickers are what you give to people that do a good job. So why do we have affirmation stickers, Kitty? Oh, it's for them? Oh, did they do something awesome? No. Oh, they just are awesome. Just the way they are? Whoa, that's so cool. Well, here you go. You guys all deserve affirmation stickers because you are all awesome just the way you are. You know, God says that God loves you no matter what. God loves you just the way you are. God's love is like an affirmation sticker, but way better. And even though we can't take God's love and stick it on our shirts, we can still feel it in our hearts. We can feel it through others when someone is really nice to us or when your parents or grandparents show love to you, you can feel God's love through them. And you can show God's love to others as well by just being kind, right? It's like you can give affirmation stickers of love to everyone, <laughs> yay! <laughs> so remember, you are loved just the way you are and you can also show that love to others by just being kind to them. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for loving us exactly how we are. That you've sent your son and you've died for us because you love us. And so we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now thank you all for coming down to Children's Time. We'll see you again next week, okay? Bye. Our scripture reading today is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will. And to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. 
that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. To bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Praise be to God. There's a famous quote by Desmond Tutu that says, you don't choose your family, they are God's gift to you as you are to them. And he's right for the most part. We don't get to choose our parents. We come out of the womb and that is our life from that point on. Those are the people that you must live with, eat with, and do life with. And sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's beautiful. But other times it is downright painful. Our scripture today talks about entering into a family that is a bit different than our nuclear family. In this new family, we are all chosen and adopted into a family where God is our mother and father. And in this new family, it, this new family comes with perks. It comes with an inheritance. It comes with redemption and forgiveness. And we are let in on the mystery of God's will. And it all sounds great, and it is, but today, we will go deeper into what it means, in a theological sense, to be God's beloved children. The letter to the Ephesians is a, it's a very special book because it is considered to encompass all of Christian life. It's actually often called the queen of the epistles because it's considered the finest of the letters. It's a great summary of Christian belief and behavior, and it is a lot more systematic than any other letter. And what is interesting about the Ephesians, though, is that many believe that it wasn't actually written by Paul, or that it actually wasn't written to the church in Ephesus. Paul spent two years in Ephesus, which we know from the book of Acts, and he even founded the church. And so it's really odd for Paul to write a letter to the Ephesians without including any personal greetings, as he does in all of his other letters. Also, in earlier manuscript, the word Ephesians is not even included. However, this doesn't take away from the credibility of its contents, and it could be considered a general letter for Christians in, in general. In the first half of Ephesians chapters 1 to 3, it teaches on our relationship with God in Christ. The second half, chapters 4 to 6, teaches on our relationship with one another. And so knowing this information, it begins to paint a picture of the purpose of our reading today. Now, it was really difficult for me as I was preparing this sermon to prevent myself from shifting focus to relationship with one another, especially because the topic is family, right? But I even wrote in, in big, bold, red letters, make sure to focus on our relationship with God because that's what this part is about. And the reason why it is so important to focus, our relation, focus on our relationship with God here is because as Ephesians is a summary on our basic beliefs, we need to first learn who we are through the lens of God. In order to know ourselves, we must know our Creator. And so when we read about being destined for adoption as God's children through Christ, what does that mean? 
Now, a lot of preachers like to explore predestination and election here, but we aren't going to go that route because then you get into free will and whether it really exists and all that crazy stuff. And so, at least today, we're going to focus on the part where God chooses us to be God's beloved children. And in order to do that, we have to put on our Wesleyan Methodist hats and we're going to travel back in time to the days of your confirmation. When we learned about prevenient grace, do you remember that word, prevenient grace? I'm sure most of you need a refresher. Uh, so prevenient grace in simple terms is grace that precedes or comes before. John Wesley understood grace as God's active presence in our lives. This presence is, is, isn't dependent on our actions or qualifications, but is, it is a gift, a gift that is always available. And this grace, it stirs up within us a desire to know God, and it empowers us to respond to God's invitation to be in relationship with God. It also enables us to discern differences between good and evil, and it makes it possible to choose good over evil. And so this prevenient grace it is a necessity to live our lives as God's children. The great thing about this grace is that it is God that takes the initiative in relating to us. We don't have to beg or plead with God for God's love and grace. This prevenient grace is what I believe the writer of the Ephesians is talking about when she or he wrote that we are destined for adoption. One caveat, though, to prevenient grace is that we can still refuse it. We can refuse the active presence of God in our lives as we see fit. So we can refuse that adoption into God's family if we choose to. However, this does not determine whether it is still available to us all. And one more Methodist lesson here. If you remember Wesley's order of salvation, his ordo salutis, uh, this is where Wesley outlines a path of our Christian walk. If you Google image search Wesley's order of salvation, you can see a little diagram of steps, and sometimes it's shown as a ladder, um, and it begins with prevenient grace, and justification comes before sanctification. I know it's a, it, this is a lot of Methodist words here, but basically it means that, that we are ex first accepted by God, just as we are, in order for God to shape us into the best version of us. So God's prevenient grace and justifying grace comes to us no matter who we are. It is, it is available for all. As Romans 5, 8 says, God proves God's love for us in that we are that we still were sinners, that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. I know this may not be a surprise for most of us as the good Methodists that we are. I'm sure we've had the Order of Salvation poster up on our walls and we talk about it at every potluck, right? But what does it mean in a practical way that can shape how we see life, how we see ourselves or each other, and how we see God? All of the rest of life, starting from when we are born to when we begin schooling to when we get a job, we are taught on a system based on reward and punishment. When we are good, we are rewarded, and when we are bad, we are punished. And this becomes ingrained in who we are and how we see life, and eventually into even how we see God. But we can clearly see that God loves and accepts us even when we are bad, while we were still sinners, it says. God does not operate out of a reward and punishment system. No, God operates out of a grace system. God is ever patient, ever kind, and ever loving. And it's a difficult concept to grasp because we've been so indoctrinated by everything else and it almost seems like it's cheating, doesn't it? Like there's a part of us that says, wait, no, if you do bad, you're definitely gonna be punished, you're gonna get what you deserve, 
right? Like you can't be teaching kids that God loves you no matter what. Like or you're just going to get a bunch of troublemakers that abuse it. And I get it. It is what makes sense to us. But this is not who God is. God loves us despite who we are, despite what we do. Christ died while we were still sinners. Christ took the blame, took our blame. And when we enter into the family of God, we give up all blame and we are accepted just as we are. It sounds radical, and that is because it's supposed to be radical. The gospel is extraordinary. It's crazy talk. It made people during Jesus' time say, are you out of your mind? You can't be saying you don't need to obey the 613 laws and that love is freely given to you. But we can see that this extraordinary news that is the gospel It created a political and societal revolution that completely flipped the world on its head. It created a bunch of people that serve God not in order to be loved, but because they were loved. And that is what fueled the apostolic ministry of Paul and the disciples of Christ. So today I I encourage you, if you are striving for approval, if any part of you feels like you must do in order to be loved, stop and realize that you are already so loved. God loves you infinitely in abundance already. God has loved and will continue to love you to the nth degree. Now I'd like to conclude with an observation I had this week of my own family Recently, Noah has been loving to help out. No matter what it is, whether he is capable of helping or not, if he sees me doing some sort of work, he comes and he says, I can help. It's so sweet. It's so sweet. And I love, I love his servant heart. However, there are times when his help is more of an impedance. I was trying to remove our flat screen off the wall so that I could drill a hole and route the cables through. And so I'm carrying this giant TV and Noah comes over and says, I can help. And I can't tell him no because I don't want to discourage him in helping others. So he comes and he grabs the TV and he gets all his greasy fingers all over the screen. (laughs) And I'm trying to maneuver over him with this giant TV and it can get pretty frustrating. I have to really regulate myself to not get mad. Because even though it could be annoying, I see his heart. I see that he is genuinely wanting to be helpful. And I want him to feel important. So I smile and I say, thank you for helping. And you're such a great helper, Noah. So if I, a flawed human being, can patiently love and accept my child, how much more can our God love you even when you aren't the best? Even when you are being a nuisance and getting in the way? I know without a doubt that God sees you and loves you more than you can ever comprehend. Amen. As we pray together, I invite you to join your voice with mine by responding to the words, Lord, in your mercy, with the words, hear our prayer. Let us pray together. God of joy, we lift up Abby, who had a birthday last week on the 8th, who I completely forgot to mention. We pray for Chris Pimlot, whose birthday is today, Dorothy Landreth and Joe Ward, whose birthday is on the 14th, and Stephanie Colbert and Chloe Perlis, who will be celebrating their birthdays on the 16th. Will you fill their week with joy and celebration? God of everlasting peace, we lift up John Zanussi, cousin of Donna Fontana's husband and his family. Please keep and carry them through this time of sadness and loss. Cover them with your love and give their weary hearts rest and their minds sound asleep. 
Give them peace knowing that John is now resting in your arms for eternity. Lord, in your mercy. God of healing, we thank you for your healing over Ruth Hartman, a friend of Donna Fontana, and that she is now doing well. We pray for the sick and in pain. Would you bring healing and restoration to their body, mind, and spirit? We lift up Jan Wyckoff as, receive, as she received the procedure this week. We pray for a speedy recovery and any pain to be eased. We lift up Heather Whitney, granddaughter-in-law of Betty Wilburn, who had surgery. Would you guide her through the healing process and give her strength as she recovers? We lift up everyone on the prayer list and all those we hold in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. God of protection, we pray for your self-keeping of our loved ones and all those around the world from the coronavirus and any variant of it. We pray for the doctors the nurses and hospital staff who are caring for the patients, that you will give them strength, hope, and peace as they continue to fight against this virus. We pray for the scientists that are developing the vaccines, that you make that you may give them insight and wisdom to create more effective vaccinations against this virus. We also pray for those that have lost family members or are still searching for those that have been affected by the building collapse in Florida. We pray for peace in their hearts. We pray for comfort and for people to surround them with love and support. We pray for the first responders and rescue team in finding the lost family members, that you would guide their eyes, their hands, and their feet. Lord, in your mercy. Sovereign and mighty God, we lift up our country and the leadership of our country. Would you grant them grace and wisdom as they lead this country out of the hole that the pandemic has caused? We pray for our church as we ourselves recover from the pandemic, would you guide us to become once again a beacon of hope to our community, community and use us to bring your love and grace to the world? Lord, in your mercy. All these things we ask of you, our loving God, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now please join us as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and power and glory forever and ever. Amen. And now please join me as we offer our gifts to God. Gracious God, thank you that you give the gift of abundant, eternal life. You have said that you are a good God who gives us good gifts. Your generosity overflows to us. Everything we have is a gift from you. As we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the abundant blessings you have given us. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and strength, be unto you our God forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, but ever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is My soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. 
O Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. I sin, all oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. I sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, face the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Now please join us for the benediction. May the peace of God rest upon us. May the love of God engulf us and fill every part of our hearts. And may the goodness of God give us reason to find the good in one another and love one another as we love ourselves. Amen.